Coming up next on We Are Marshall Today, the West Virginia Legislature convenes for its annual session. We'll talk with Marshall University President Stephen Kopp about the future of our university. Plus, these new containers are popping up all over campus. An update on Marshall's new recycling program. These stories and more up next on We Are Marshall Today. Hi and welcome to We Are Marshall Today. I'm Leah Edwards. And I'm Bill Bissett. Reporters from across the mountain state recently gathered at Marshall University's South Charleston campus for a special day of education. It wasn't your typical classroom experience, but these reporters certainly were taking notes. It sounds easy enough. Find out the facts and tell the story in a concise and fair manner. But for news reporters, there are often hours of unseen preparation. The Associated Press, in an effort to help reporters get a jump start on this year's legislative session, recently sponsored its 11th annual legislative look ahead. Oftentimes when you're covering a session, things are happening very quickly and you're not getting any kind of backgrounding into it. And so these sessions are really trying to give people um, a casual way to learn about um, issues that will come up for the legislature. The day's events included various panel discussions on legislative issues. At the top of the list was how the state will handle continuing financial woes. It's a scenario the governor says is not near as severe as what other states, though, are experiencing. We're in a planning mode. We're not in a panic mode. And we don't need to get in a panic mode. And uh, I want to make sure that people understand just keep doing what we do get best in West Virginia. Take care of your family, work hard, and keep spending money. Governor Manchin briefed reporters on dozens of other topics, including his specific agenda for the legislature. The day-long session was more than just an educational opportunity for reporters. It was also a chance for Marshall University to showcase its South Charleston campus. What this event does is it allows us to get together with reporters from around the state. So this is the fourth year, I believe, that we've hosted the Associated Press Legislative Look Ahead. And so it brings uh, reporters from around the state to the university campus, to the South Charleston campus. So it just gives us a chance to provide a service for them and also for us to interact with them. About 20 print and broadcast reporters from around the state attended the event. For We Are Marshall Today, I'm Leah Edwards. Joining us now, entering his fifth year as the leader of Marshall University, is Dr. Stephen Kopp, President of Marshall. Good to be here, Bill. We appreciate you taking the time, Mr. President. My pleasure. Wanted to begin with a topic that you've talked a great deal about really since you started as presidency, enrollment. This really, since you've been at Marshall University, is the first year we've really had some positive news, I think, as it comes to enrollment. How has that come about, and where does it go from here, if I may ask? Well, that's correct, Bill. It's the first year we've seen overall enrollment growth. Uh, freshman enrollment growth has been going up for the last few years. Um, it took time to overcome what was in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you do that is a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all about relationships. And cultivating relationships, getting out into the high schools, building um, and stewarding uh, strong relationships with you know, everybody from the principal uh, to the students that are thinking about going to college, mm -hmm. uh, and then maintaining those relationships throughout the year, uh, year after year. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't start recruiting seniors. Uh, you've got to start with freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, as well as seniors, and continue those relationships. And it's all about the people that we have in our recruitment office, uh, mm -hmm. working hand in glove with our admissions office. And uh, this year, we're, we're again looking at a very strong uh, application uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. um, it's too early to tell yet how those numbers are going to translate into entering first, first time uh, freshmen. Um, but um, I always remain op optimistic that we're on the right track. I see the evidence that we are, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm very excited about the prospects. The overall goal is we not only want to improve our freshman numbers, we want to improve over overall retention of students, mm -hmm. not just first to second year, but all the way through graduation. One of the messages I share with um, high school students and their, and their parents when they come here to campus mm -hmm. and when I'm in the high schools, talking to students about their future and about uh, opportunities that college uh, provides for them is the importance of not just starting their education, their college education, but finishing it, earning their degree. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important part about the process. Starting a college education and not finishing is tantamount to not starting at all. Mm -hmm. And that message is one that we continue to, to amplify and uh, repeat because it's so, so vitally important not just to Marshall University, it's important to our state, mm -hmm. and it's important to our nation. 
this is a national call. You've heard President Obama uh, articulate the importance of a college education in the, in the future of this great nation. Uh, we embrace that, that concept and we're doing everything we can to advance it. Outstanding. And I, I know obviously Provost Ormerston is uh, locked into those efforts closely as no well. No question. Uh, he's doing a phenomenal job. Uh, he's uh, <coughs> building the kind of uh, uh, base support that we need, the faculty, departmental level, college level, um, and cultivating that because this is a very, very important priority for the university. And mm -hmm. all of the goals, many of the goals that we have that re relate to everything from compensation to uh, overall development of the university are really tied to enrollment growth and retention of our students and graduation rates. Excellent. Well, I know one of the ways we attract prospective students to Marshall mm -hmm. is academic programs that have great demand, not only from students, but also employers. Uh, your board has recently voted to support both a physical therapy program as well as a pharmacology, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmacology program. No, pharmacy school. Pharmacy school. What does that mean to prospective students, not just at the graduate level, but also undergraduate? Well, I think when you look at the opportunities that exist in these uh, competitive fields, uh, we're, we're looking at serving the needs of this, this part of the state as well as this region. And these are two shortage areas, high demand areas in terms of professional education and mm -hmm. professional practice. Uh, we're working with partners on this that uh, see the need, uh, see a very critical need, mm -hmm. and so we're trying to address a need uh, in this state and in this region. As importantly, these are areas of opportunity for students that come to Marshall University. Obviously, we're going to give preference to Marshall graduates in terms of their matriculation and admission into these programs. Uh, they're selective, meaning not that there'll be more applications than uh, there'll be places, and we understand that. Mm -hmm. But it provides opportunity uh, that's uh, needed in this part of the state, in this region, and that's something that I'm very committed to. Uh, these are programs that as we develop them, uh, will be able to support themselves when they're fully uh, enrolled, uh, and they provide very strong uh, uh, integration possibilities and connections to our medical school mm -hmm. and to strategic investments we've already made here at the university. So uh, when you begin to look at the portfolio of uh, degree offerings and degree programs where we can uh, gain uh, synergies, if you will, mm -hmm. between faculty who are hired who not only are involved in the classroom but involved in research activities that connect to what we're doing in the biotechnology area what we're doing in the biomedical sciences, what we're doing in the medical sciences, there's a great uh, deal of opportunity here to build on a very successful platform with our medical school, mm -hmm. our forensic science program, and so on, uh, and building on the strength of our college of science. So when you look at the assets that we currently have in the university, both people assets as well as physical resource assets, mm -hmm. these two programs make very, very good sense and synergize with what we already have in place here at the university. And I'm very pleased that the board sees those connections and is willing to advance uh, the development of these programs. It makes a lot of sense. And I know another program tied both to fundraising and academics in the future of Marshall uh, is the Bucks for Brains program and your right. institute. If you can mention, it was mentioned recently in the State of the State by Governor Manchin. Give us kind of a snapshot where we're going in 2010 with that program. Well, we're, we have a lot of fundraising we need to do. And we've uh, uh, had some. Uh, very significant donors who have stepped up and supported uh, this very, very important initiative for not just for Marshall University. This is an economic development engine uh, for uh, this region. And uh, uh, we're at about five, almost six percent of our, our matching goal. We've got a lot of work to do in the next few years. Uh, we're working on behalf of the Ray Hall Transportation Institute as well as the Marshall Institute for Interdisciplinary Research. This mm -hmm. is about creating and developing endowment-based research here at Marshall University. And when I look ahead, uh, look at the out years in terms of what we're, what we're working on, uh, this program is a self-sustaining, self-generating program the way we've set it up. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I think the legislature saw great wisdom in and uh, supported. Uh, it was led by the governor. Uh, this is a very significant investment in the future of not only Marshall University, but economic development in this part of the state mm -hmm. as well as the region. And uh, I think it's a very, very important initiative here. 
Uh, to date, we've added uh, two research scientists, the lead scientist for the Marshall Institute for Interdisciplinary Research. Mm -hmm. They're in the process of generating grant funding. They're developing projects that can be grant supported. Uh, we're looking for partnerships with the private sector uh, that can bring in uh, contracts and other sorts of funding and research development mechanisms. And the way we've structured this, we're a very attractive partner to the private sector, which I'm very pleased with. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, obviously difficult economic times, but a lot of good news for Marshall University. Still an optimistic time to be at Marshall? Absolutely. I, I think that uh, anybody who is uh, uh, taking on the challenges of becoming a university president and leading uh, a university as fine as Marshall University mm -hmm. understands that there are always inherent challenges. Often there are budget challenges that we uh, uh, face. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look at all the good things that are happening at Marshall University, uh, I'm very pleased and proud to see where we are. Uh, four and a half years later, uh, we've mm -hmm. made a tremendous, tremendous strides, lots of progress and milestones that we can point to. Uh, we just announced last week, for instance, that we become a member of Internet 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a huge step forward for this university and this region because this connectivity is not just unique to Marshall University. It provides a resource for our community. Uh, it ties in uh, the two major health uh, uh, health care providers, mm -hmm. St. Mary's Medical Center, Cabell Huntington Hospital, providing uh, uh, access to uh, high technology, uh, cyber infrastructure resources that we <coughs> otherwise wouldn't have access to here. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, in many ways, we're the facilitator, but at the same time, it advantages our whole re research portfolio here at the, at the university. So um, this is a consortium arrangement. We're working with partners in other states. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a wonderful conference last week that brought uh, collaborators, potential collaborators from Indiana University to campus. Uh, mm -hmm. They are by far the leaders in the nation in terms of cyber infrastructure and its utilization. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from them. And we see enhancements not only to healthcare, we see it in terms of biomedical research and research in general because it covers the whole portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, we see opportunities for enhanced learning environments. When you begin to look at the uh, simulation and uh, virtual reality environments and some of the high tech applications mm -hmm. that can now be facilitated through Internet, too, it opens up new frontiers and opportunities for us that we otherwise wouldn't have had. Outstanding. Well, Dr. Kopp, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. There is one other point I'd like to, to mention. Uh, uh, of we've, made a very, we've made a very significant hire recently. Uh, um, who would that be, Mr. President? Uh, our new football coach. Oh, uh, give us your take on him. Doc Holliday, um, I'm very pleased Doc has joined Marshall University. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I was very impressed with him during the interview process. Mm -hmm. um, his passion is palpable and contagious. Uh, and uh, the opportunities he's going to bring here to restore championship uh, football here at Marshall, uh, I'm very, very excited about. And Mike Hamrick, our new AD, is doing an outstanding job mm -hmm. uh, in uh, six short months, basically. And uh, I see just tremendous uh, growth and opportunity here, uh, not only now but in the future. And, of course, our... Uh, Head uh, men's basketball coach Donnie Jones mm -hmm. uh, has uh, infused a great deal of excitement in the community no uh, through the successes uh, of our men's basketball program. We're seeing the development of our women's program as well. Um, there's a lot. There's a buzz. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in my fifth year, and and I'm hearing a buzz like I haven't heard before. And uh, Interestingly, right now, it's around basketball, and in the background, you hear a lot of excitement about football as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, when you ask, is it an exciting time here to be at Marshall, it certainly is. Absolutely. As you said before, we're all on one team, and that, that team is Marshall. That's right. Mr. President, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bill. Up next, remembering Dr. King. The Marshall University community recently honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with a day of activities aimed at helping those in need. Approximately 1,000 meals were served to the needy, elderly, and homeless. The food was donated by Sodexo and drinks by the Pepsi Company. The day's events culminated at 16th Street Baptist Church where Dr. Philip Williams delivered the keynote address. The interfaith service also included members of the local Muslim and Jewish communities. Marshall University is now online with the nation's ultra-fast information network. 
Internet2 is a networking system dedicated to research, education, and healthcare. Marshall's membership in the consortium allows its students, staff, and faculty access, access to some of the most cutting edge technologies in the world. Marshall officials say they've been working on the project for six months, although planning has been in years in the making. There's a new recycling effort on Marshall's campus. Part of the new program included giving away aluminum water bottles the first week of the spring semester. The university's newly named recycling coordinator says other initiatives include recycling pods, which have been placed around campus. We put out locations to recycle. We let students and faculty know what they can and can't recycle. Rutherford is a Marshall graduate who was named to the newly created position in January. A Rotary International group from South Korea toured Marshall University in early January. The stop was part of a month-long tour of so the southern part of West Virginia. Rotary International is a group of business and professional leaders. A week before the spring semester started, when most students were enjoying their final few days of winter break, one group of students was already on campus attending class. That's right, Leah. As Dr. Chris Swindell reports, dozens of resident advisors were attending a semi-annual leadership training, preparing for the second semester. Meet Greg Parkins, a sophomore from Boone County, West Virginia, studying biomedical science. He's learning biology and chemistry from his professors, but during this training session, his focus is on team building skills. That's because Parkins is a resident advisor for Marshall University, and it's his responsibility to create a positive experience for his residents. The lessons, he says, are invaluable for his current job and future ones as well. You really just gain people's skills. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing for me. Like, you learn how to interact because, it, I mean, it's a big thing out, you know, after you get out of college and everything, how, that you know how to interact with people, take in consideration people's feelings, like especially if you get a job in, in a field where you have to deal with people, you know, that's, that's, that's a big responsibility and a big thing out in the real world. Parkins is one of approximately 50 resident advisors at Marshall University. They're formally trained twice a year and exposed to a variety of scenarios. One of the most difficult things is the unexpected. They, they don't know what to expect, emergency situations, how to handle them. And the best thing we can do is offer them scenarios of what if, what if this happens. Um, a lot of times they get intimidated by administrative things, paperwork, um, the little duties here and there, bulletin boards. But we do our best to keep them as organized as possible. We want to make sure that they understand the value of the position that they have, that they hold a great deal of power and influence with their residents. We want them to understand um, both what the residents need and what they can contribute to their college experience um, and really make sure that they're being successful in their academic careers as well. Hurley says the RA application process begins later this semester. Interested students should watch for informational flyers. Resident advisors are compensated with free room and board and a small monthly stipend. For We Are Marshall Today, I'm Dr. Christopher Swindell. Joining us now to talk about residence life is the Director of Resident Services here at Marshall University, John Yon. Yeah, thank you for having me, Leah. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, welcome to the show and uh, tell us a little bit about your job and what you do here at Marshall. Well, currently I'm the Director of Resident Services and so pretty much what that means is working with a team to really look at the vision and future of where the department's going, to really assess a number of initiatives where we're going to look at our housing, uh, to look at our occupancy rates and see how we can increase those at somewhat, to look at our IT, um, our information technology areas, and also our residence life area, which is composed of our RAs and our RDs who run the residence halls. And so that composed, is composed of training and selection of staff. And so it's really working with a group of assistant directors to look at all of that and sort of how we really are meeting the needs of students and how we can better the department, not only now, but in the next five, ten years. You're relatively new here, and so I failed to ask you when we first started. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and where you were before you came to Marshall. Sure. Originally, I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, where I did my undergrad and grad work. And um, I just recently came from the University of Miami, where I was an associate director of residence life. And I was there just under two years or so and decided I wanted to become a director and run an entire department. And so I looked at a few schools, and I thought Marshall would be the best fit for me. And so... Uh, so here I am, and so I've been a director of resident services now just about um, about 10 months or so. And I also teach Holocaust and genocide studies, so I'm also teaching a course for the university as well. Okay. Well, residence life, uh, when you think about the college experience, is a major component of that experience. Um, 
tell me a little bit about what you think about that, that experience and how students can benefit from living on campus. Sure, it's a great question. I think a lot of students don't realize the benefits that they get from living on campus. And so I've done research in the past and looked at a lot of research that in the field of higher education and a lot of it shows that students who live on campus are likely going to attain higher GPAs, are going to graduate at higher percentages and rates, have more interactions with faculty, and really have an overall better college experience by being connected to more students, more faculty, more staff. Um, just feeling like they're really a part of the college experience and we want all students to be able to have that experience and of course you know the primary reason they're here is to get a degree and do well in school and I think it's one of our goals academically is to prepare them not only to be successful in college but in their uh, post-college years as well and so we try to then translate that as to what we can do in the residence halls through what we call co-curricular experiences to really assist our students with finding what they're doing in the classroom and then creating experiences in the residence halls to enhance that success in the classroom and also get them ready or at least introduce them to the skills, the, co the uh, resources on campus to be able to assist them with either getting into a grad school or if it's getting a career just after they graduate. So there's a lot involved there, but really I think we look at our role as we want to complement the strategic mission of the university, but we want to assist these students with being successful and have really a complete college experience. How many uh, students do we have living on campus? Currently right now we have about uh, just under 2,000 students living on campus. That includes, of course, our first year halls as well. And I, at capacity, we would likely be close to around 2,400, just over 2,400 students. So one of our goals this year is to really increase our, our amount of occupancy on, uh, on campus in our residence halls. What, what is the university's policy as far as uh, students who have to live in a residence hall? Sure. Uh, our first year students or our freshmen or sophomore students are required to live on campus. And then, of course, once they complete 60 credits or their sophomore year, they can determine if they want to move off campus. But we hopefully we can talk to and show our juniors and seniors that living on campus is really has a positive beneficial impact on their college experience, on their grades. Um, and on, of course, what they do after college. And so we're, we're really pushing that this year. And, you know, I think that's something that's been a, a bit elusive to our department in the past is really not appealing to those students. And so hopefully we can uh, really improve that this year. Mm -hmm. um, there's this uh, phrase, I think, called living learning communities. Yes. Um, speak to, to that concept and um, what we do with it here at Marshall. Sure. Living learning communities are basically small groups of students either based on uh, a college, what you call college-based learning, where students either from a certain college, like education, engineering, or business, live together on a particular floor, or what we have is our theme floors. Uh, a new floor, for example, of a theme floor would be our Be Green, or Living the Green Life floor oh, okay. this year. And that falls with our sustainability plan, which really um, also incorporates what the university is doing around sustainability. And so one of the things we'll be doing is creating a floor with that theme. But, but really, there are groups of students who want to live, again, live together around a certain theme, or they take classes together and they live together on a certain floor. And a lot of research in the field will show that students who live in living learning communities on campus tend to do better, better academically than their non-LLC peers in the same residence hall. Um, so we want to have more living learning communities uh, one goal in the future would be to have perhaps a residential college, which is an entire building that's focused on either a STEAM or a college or whatnot. We also have a first year residential experience in our Twin Towers Hall that specifically is geared to meet the needs of our freshman or first year students. And so we have very specific activities and programs that what we found is based on research meets the needs of what we think first year students face in their first two semesters because our retention rate is, uh, the university's retention rate is something that we're looking to improve right now. I think it's around 71 or 72 percent, but over the next four years, I think the university wants to get that up closer to 80 percent. And so we know in the residence halls, we have a role in assisting our students with things that will hopefully bring them back to the university. And so we want to make sure we're doing our part in that effort. So aside from living learning communities, are there any other groupings and, and the freshman learning experience, are there any other groupings on campus? Or, um? uh, we have, we're going to have an upper class hall in Haymaker, which will be our juniors and seniors. Again, that's to have a living experience specifically geared towards their particular needs and those two groups of people. Of course, we have the first year residential experience in Twin Towers. And of course, in the first year halls, 
uh, they're all first year students living there. Otherwise, we pretty much most of our halls have first year through senior uh, students living there. But I think with the increase in living learning communities and, um, and the special interest floors, what we're doing is we're hoping to have more specific floors designated to those uh, particular ideas. Mm -hmm. And one, one last question, what sure. about gender? Um, are there mixed halls and, uh, and then halls that are dedicated solely to one gender? Yeah, there are mixed halls, uh, not any dedicated to one particular gender. The only one dedicated to one gender would be Busker Hall. It's an all-female hall. It's one of our very popular halls students enjoy living in. Otherwise, uh, the, the floors are, um, they're not co-ed on the floor, but you might have a female floor than a male floor etc. And yeah. so that's how the floors are, gen are, uh, um, are situated now. And so, and overall I think students enjoy that experience and so we'll continue to look at other trends in, in university housing and residence life around the country to see really what we need to be doing to uh, meet the needs of our current students. Okay, John Yon, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. It's a place where two worlds collide and the exchange creates education. We're talking about Marshall University's Visualization Lab. Videographer Mike Powers takes us there. We're looking toward building a, a virtual world that can be connected uh, to through the internet that can mirror the real world. Now, in this virtual world, we're looking at uh, training. We're looking at uh, uh, a, uh, as a resource for uh, learning and also for collaboration, such as conferencing. Uh, meetings. There's, there's two principal components. One is this uh, new building that, that we have that was uh, uh, that's been supported by the Weisberg family and this was opened last August for the College of Information Technology and Engineering and we are very lucky to have this big box at the end here uh, which we have developed into a visualization laboratory. The Pièce de résistance, the, the main uh, 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 piece of equipment is just behind us. It's called the Power Wall by uh, Mechdyne, is the company. And this in itself uh, costs $470,000. It is unique, certainly unique in the state. Um, it has uh, uh, two very large uh, Sony projectors, which are the uh, which are state of the art projectors. Uh, no other university has more powerful projectors than this. Um, it gives a super high definition image in stereo. So it's, if you uh, look at your HD high definition uh, TV set, the definition on this power wall is four times the definition of that TV set. The visualization is a principal component of the cyber infrastructure, which we're building up now at Marshall University. And we, Marshall has, uh, probably at the present time one of the best if not the best cyber infrastructure of any of the institutions. The bottom line in this economic development project is to help businesses to uh, create new businesses and in the end create new jobs. Thank you for watching. We are Marshall Today. I'm Leah Edwards. And I'm Bill Bissett. We'll see you next time.